Well, I always said you couldn't ignore the elephant in the room, and <laughs> I thought that'd be a good way to begin a presentation. <laughs> Obviously not. <laughs> anyway, uh, guys, uh, it, it's great to be here. I've got a love story to tell you today. Uh, as you see in the, in the program, my title is Talk Number Nine. Um, and so I actually, I guess I'll, I'll spin off that and say Love Potion Number Nine. Uh, which the front of the room totally gets. Those in the back of the room that are tweeting right now have no idea what I'm talking about, uh, but they're Googling it now, so it's okay. <laughs> anyway, uh, we've got a really, really exciting thing that's going on. So uh, before I begin, I, I want to also put you guys at ease. I talked to some of you during the break, and you, know, you expressed sympathy that not only was my picture not in the program and my title wasn't in the program, but how on earth do you follow? I mean, some really awesome, exciting presentations. I'm the last, the number nine of some really talented, exciting leaders in the Atlanta area. And uh, I want to put you at ease that I'm very, very, very accustomed to being the dumbest of nine. No, I'm, I'm very serious. Look, I, I have eight brothers and sisters. So my entire life, almost, I have been the dumbest of nine. Said, That's actually my brother. It's not a serial killer. Uh, <laughs> although with Breaking Bad and Dexter recently, who really knows? <laughs> Anyway, I work at AdCap Network Systems, and we are the 2013 Cisco Partner of the Year. So we are a much smaller company than a lot of the other speakers. We have less than 100 employees, and we do very, very complicated integrations of technology, whether it be data center, voice, whatever it may be. Very, very niche. And so when it comes to finding talent that's done those type of activities, it's a big, big challenge that I have. Uh, and my role, because, again, we're a small organization, I have to take the entire talent management spectrum and do all of it. And the cool thing about that is kind of what uh, Joanne was talking about with the integration of talent management. Well, I don't really have a choice. I've got myself and some awesome interns, and that's really what makes the whole company go. And so everything from talent acquisition on the recruitment side, uh, the assessment side, through the training and development, through the performance and strategic alignment, and to Joanne's point, it's all secular. What we learn in the acquisition process, we integrate into custom learning branches on the training side. What we do in the training side, we learn tons. So many orientation, they take a lot of information, they assess people, and then they put it in a file drawer, and the manager doesn't even know if they did well or not. Not only is it not pass-fail even, I mean, sorry, is it pass-fail? It normally is just pass orientation, passed. Not pass-fail, not grades, not here strengths and weaknesses. So much information that's being lost, and, and an ad cap, because I'm doing the recruitment and the training and the performance management component, I get to integrate all of those things and then find, hey, what does someone good look like, and then cycle that back to my recruitment side. Uh, so like many of you, I've got lots of requisitions on my board that are very, very difficult to fill. Uh, how many of you uh, or have your organizations have a requisition that's a pain in your butt? I mean, right? Like the impossible to fill one? You guys are lucky. Wow, jeez. Uh, anyway, so I've got those. Uh, because, again, for instance, for a salesperson, if you haven't sold Cisco products specifically, it takes over six months just to learn the basic comprehensive competencies to be successful in that role. It doesn't matter how much training, and the reality is I can't pay someone, because we're a smaller company, a full-on salary just to go and essentially learn for six months. And so that's a really big challenge. I have the same problem on the engineering side. And so rather than continue to say, oh, you know, uh, it's the skills gap, uh, and how many of us have used that term, the skills gap? Well, look, it's been used since 2004. We were solving the skills gap. 2006, we were bridging the skills gap. And, and just two months ago, Forbes came out and said, can we fix the skills gap? And the reality is the longer we keep calling it the skills gap, the longer we're going to have this problem where there are 3.7 million jobs that we can't fill. Meanwhile, on the other side of the coin, we've got candidates that are writing and saying things like this, where I'm frustrated that without experience, I can't get experience. It's a chicken or the egg, experience to get experience. So how do I get that experience? Wait a minute. And we're, it's a self-fulfilling prophecy where we're going to hit a wall time and time again. And that's what we ran into at AdCap. And so we went back kind of to history a little bit and said, wait a minute. The employer, the company, the recruiter, collectively needs to take two steps forward and say, let me offer someone, whether it be an entry-level candidate or an industry transition, and say, hey, let me give you an entry point in your organization. Let me give you the training and tools necessary to be successful. And inversely, the candidate has to understand I may have been making six figures at my previous job that is now a completely dead industry. Well, I've got to be able to take a step back and say, let me take a step forward here and say, OK, I'm going to take a little bit less and prove myself if you'll give me that opportunity. And what I call that is the compromise gap. Uh, it really is going to take both parties coming together. Because right now, oh, oh, 
no, we don't have the employees with the skills. And the, and the candidates are like, oh, no one's giving me a job. No one's giving me experience. And it's going to be secular until we compromise. HR traditionally, talent management, uh, we all like to think about why someone can't be successful. You know, when we think about recruiters, what do they do? Applicant tracking systems. They try to find how to get rid of candidates, how to screen candidates out. We get over 1,000 resumes a week, and we're a tiny little company. I don't even want to know what you guys look at. Uh, so, of course, we've got to screen candidates out. So we think about why can't someone be successful? And we think, oh, they don't know what to do, so they can't be successful. And that costs us money. Oh, they don't know how to do it. They don't know why to do it. Or they simply can't do it. And what I want you to take out of today, I'm, I'm going to give you two pieces today. One is kind of a general philosophy change that I think a lot of us, and I mean the front group is already there, it's very apparent, that you can kind of take and move forward. And then I'll show you how on a very, very simple scaled model, whether you're a 6,000, 11,000 person company or you're a 100 person company, you can implement today. And it's going to shift the mindset. So everyone has probably typed this or, or written this in some facet. So everyone on your paper in front of you, write the words, it can't be done. And we've all typed this, I'm sure, at one point. HR has a history of being able to tell someone why something can't be done. Oh, we'd love to do that, but HR won't let us. I mean, that, that's really our reputation. We talk about wanting a seat at the table. Well, it's time that we learn how to cook. I mean, really. And so has everyone written it can't be done? Now, if you're a righty, put your pen in your left hand. And if you're a lefty, put your, hand, your pen in your right hand. And watch how easy it is to shift our mindset from it can't be done. Now, scratch out that T in apostrophe. It can be done. Now, was that easy? Yes and no. It was a little bit more difficult because we're not comfortable. We're not comfortable crossing off to saying it can be done. But it was easy. At the end of the day, we moved there. So now we can shift to instead of why would someone fail at a job, let's start looking at candidates and uh, internal candidates, external candidates, whatever it may be, and say, why could they be successful? Well, if they need to know what to do, well, then offer them performance reviews, constant feedback, not annualized, constant immediate. We talk about Gen Y. They're used to immediate feedback. Don't wait for the end of the year. They don't know how to do it. Well, offer training, offer mentorship. Why to do it? That's a big challenge. That's a little bit more amorphous. You can't necessarily just throw money at the problem. So giving people purpose that's aligned to them individually. Maybe work-life balance is important. Maybe career is important. Find out what each individual person is excited by and drive their work experience or how do you make their day at uh, AdCap or SunTrust great. Drive that with the why. And then also strive to find people who can do it. And so one of the things you'll see when with our apprentice program is that we changed the way that we looked at candidates on a collective side. So we had to go back to history. And uh, you know, we looked back to Ben Franklin and John Adams and all these great American heroes. And we said, you know, they all began as apprentices. I mean, Ben Franklin, by the way, I wouldn't, if I had put Ben Franklin on the left there, uh, you probably wouldn't have recognized him, right? Ben Franklin became the man on the right, and I, I don't know if that's actually him, uh, <laughs> and I, I don't have anything to say that he's an ass or anything like that, but uh, <laughs> if we look at him, we don't recognize him. He's a, you know, a young boy who was an apprentice in the year 1720, and you know, there's not a lot that's in common between 1720 and today, although when I was driving here, I actually realized there's something very similar in common. In 1720 and today, there was no functioning U.S. government. So we've got two things that are now moving in order. So at ADCAP, we built a sales apprenticeship and an, a technical apprenticeship program. We did it for two different programs, two different tracks that are, especially out of the gate, very aligned, entry level and industry transitions. We literally said, come to us. You don't have experience in our industry? Come this way. Come learn from us. Because I'm an ADCAP. We don't know what an ADCAP is. It's a type of torpedo. Uh, but we do know what SunTrust is and Applex. So my challenges are different than their challenges. And then there's a lot of overlap as well. Today, I only have 18 minutes. So I'm going to focus primarily on the entry level program on the sales side, uh, just because that's the simplest one to talk about. Ironically, Ed and I talked uh, about three weeks ago, which is why I'm labeled as talk number nine with uh, a white picture. Uh, they just did me before I got my tan. Uh, anyway, the, uh, the thing we were talking about was this program. He said, hey, oh, that'd be great if you could talk about that. Two days later, three days later, Hank Jackson at Sherm comes out with this blog. <sighs> I was like, but ironically, it literally says, I mean, it's, it's the exact same premise that I'd spoken to Ed about three days earlier, about how we have tried to say the skills gap is not going to be fixed unless we start doing something about it, and offering apprentice programs is part of that. How many of you know the story of Jack Hoffman? Jack Hoffman is a nine-year-old boy diagnosed with cancer and pretty much on his deathbed, essentially. They thought, hey, Jack Hoffman's got a, you know, a month or two to live, 
And one of his dreams was to run a touchdown at the University of Nebraska. And so at their spring training game, they lined up. So at the la one of the last plays, Jack Hoffman, nine-year-old, ran a touchdown in front of the, the cheering fans. And the reason I'm showing you this picture is to do something like this, you're going to need to get your whole team involved and find out what motivates them and say, hey, we can do it. Not we can't do it. Here's why we can't do it. I'm sure there's tons of reasons that this could not have happened. This magical, I mean, go watch the YouTube. It's, I mean, it makes your goosebumps. Why could this have not happened? Oh, you could have liability issues, all sorts of problems. I mean, heck, if you didn't have full buy-in, imagine one of the defenders there had tackled poor little Jack Hoffman. <laughs> I mean, if you didn't have complete team buy-in, even the referee, those cold-hearted, you know, anyway, I've got friends that are referees. Uh, so you've got to build a business case. And here was our problem. I cannot find a salesperson that has experience that's going to be able to get started within six months for these very, very niche roles. Uh, so $100,000. So the problem is I can't find the employee with the, with the skills. So rather than continue to say, oh, skills gap, sorry, boss, can't fill that role. Now I said, OK, hey, let's take that budget. Let's allocate some of that funding. And let's build a program where I was able to bring on four sales apprentices. This was my entry level group. Uh, that our goal simply, and again, it, it wasn't that complicated. Don't try to make this a huge profit center. We literally said for two years, we need this group to break even. That was our goal, for them to break even for two years while they became skilled enough to become an account manager with the group. Very simple, and yet that built a business case that provided clarity for the entire organization. Entry level, obviously, we deal with Gen Y. We've, we've mentioned millennials here a lot today. Uh, you know, Gen Y is kind of what the books say. I happen to call them Gen Y. Uh, why don't I have a raise? Why don't I have a promotion? Well, you've been here six months. Why not? You know, everything is so much faster. And so I had to tackle that. And instead, of, again, in the same way there's a skills gap, rather than denying, oh, you know, Gen Y, that's how they are. You know, that's not going to be an you know, old crotchety old man. Ah, those kids, stressed kids, spoiled again. Uh, the Scooby-Doo, if you want to Google in the back. Uh, so what we did to, prop, to fix that problem is we, right out of the gate, with every single position at AdCap, and the apprentice program is how we got it started, we focused on the idea of clear. Every position from the receptionist, uh, poor receptionist is getting shot at all day today, uh, from any role in the organization has a clear point in terms of what's their clear career path. What are their clear learning objectives, expectations, and accountabilities to reach that reward? When you're able to set that out and say, if you do this, this, and this, and build the business case around it, well, now all of a sudden, guess what? You can actually execute that reward because the business case is there. The triggers are there, and you've now empowered them. And we talk about engagement. That's empowering your employee to have control over their own destiny. So they won't ask why anymore. Uh, and so for the career path, literally, when you came on as a sales apprentice with us, you had your next four steps of your career clearly outlined. You started as an apprentice. Three to 12 months on your own pace, depends on when you hit the business objectives that were outlined for you. Then you moved in inside sales, then into a junior account manager, and then to an account manager. You had control of the time. That's why those timelines say three to 12, six to 12, and we did a similar program on our technical side. If you look at our commercial sales side, again, it's a smaller department than many of you have, but you could take this program and go put it into one of your departments that you're having trouble recruiting for or you're not necessarily finding it interesting, you see those dark blue arrows? What those are? Those are career paths. Every single role in that organization has career paths that lead to something new, and they know what it is, and they know what learning objectives, expectations, and accountabilities they need to do to reach that reward. The other cool thing about the apprentice program that I really want to clarify is why do I call it an apprentice program? What makes it an apprentice program versus just looking for cheap talent, you know, using these poor kids that are uh, you know, out there you know, looking for work? And the reality is what makes it an apprentice program is the blend. It's a blend between training, actual, tangible, concrete work experience that's relevant to their career path, and mentorship. And as you can imagine, uh, the key would be how do you get mentors? So for the sales group, what motivates salespeople in your organization? Mo that's so weird, mine too. <laughs> that's real fascinating. Uh, anyone else have money motivate their salespeople? Oh, no one else, just us, we're good. Uh, but no, I mean, really, so I think I'm being a little facetious here. Obviously, money is one of the prime motivators, not just altruism. And so we built our program where each step along the way, a sales apprentice was tied to a single mentor, one of our top account managers. And what they were able to do now is see along the way, the first 60 days, there wasn't much ROI. But we've already seen a 13% increase in revenue of the mentor-mentee relationship that's being recognized on the account manager. They're getting commissioned. 
So now, if that account manager makes their sales apprentice better, well, the account manager is motivated by money. And he receives that. And same thing on the engineering side. Now they're able to do more exciting projects because they can take some of the more menial work out of their day-to-day -day task. And as they get their engineer there, and each kind of thing builds on it. There's a sales apprentice that comes behind the BDR, behind the junior account manager. And you see we even built a kind of legacy. Uh, you know, I've talked about the idea of uh, how do you tie this thing long-term. Legacy-wise, every year, on average, again, it's, it's, it's a percentage, actually, but $15,000 is what the account manager is going to glean for every account manager that they spin out. So now they're long-term motivated. So I kind of you know, took it from the multi-level marketing kind of, kind of program, but then I put it into a legitimate business. Uh, no defense to Amway. Uh, so as you can imagine, when we had the, uh, the, the position posted, we said entry level, and we said recent graduates, so we really meant entry level, not cheap talent. Again, this is a W-2 position. It's a full-time, benefits, all the stuff. I mean, it's not a way to get cheap labor. It's someone who can be an account manager. And if they can't be an account manager, we don't want them. Well, when I posted this position with, all, with the career path laid out, we got tons and tons and tons of people that were interested and phone calls from parents who were interested in getting their kids out of their house. <laughs> no, no, really. Well, we did have a few parents, actually. Uh, if you haven't had that yet, wait for it. It's coming. Uh, anyway, and so... Now I've got all these, we got over 600 resumes the first time we did this, over 1,000 the second time we did it. And again, no one knows who AdCap is. Uh, so all they're doing is seeing, oh my God, a, a clearly defined career path and getting excited by it. But now all these resumes, they look relatively the same. And I can't necessarily use traditional, because I'm not getting the recent Harvard graduate or whatever good school. I'm going to stay up north to, to keep myself safe after the presentation. Uh, but whatever good school is up there, I'm getting you know, the people on the fringe a little bit. And so I've got to look at them differently. So we completely threw out resumes as part of our application process. And we started with a one-way video. Uh, basically, we asked them questions. They can record it at their own time. I'll show you what that looks like in a second. Their second, they had to do research on one of our products and do a three-minute presentation. How can they learn? How can they comprehend what we're doing? Then we did a culture and personality fit assessment, which is really cool. We did a baseline culture assessment and then see how do they fit into that. And then the last final interviews with eight other people, they were all role plays. So we had them pretend to be a cold caller. No one had the resume. It was simply based on practical. Can they do what we're asking them to do in this job? What kind of potential do they demonstrate when we measure them that way? Uh, we used a company called Spark Hire for our video interview. Awesome. Uh, I'm a fan, so I'm not a sponsor of them. I'm a fan. Uh, and they actually gave me a discount code. If you use all capital BRAD, you get one free job interview. Because uh, they knew I was going to mention them here today. I asked for their logo. Uh, but what you can do is basically they can record it at their own time, and then you can rate them. So I can send that off to my whole team, they can rate, and then I can decide who, want, who do they want to bring in based on that aggregated rating score. And then we used Roundpeg, another awesome company, different tools that are out there to do a culture assessment. We did a culture baseline of things and took it from there. Uh, finally, I'll skip all the practical, technical. So here are a couple of our apprentices. I just want to highlight a couple of them just to let you see what a diverse and awesome group we were able to get. Uh, there was George. George was a... Uh, Q and a, a QA uh, person in a previous life, he had went back to technical college, came out, and literally no one was giving him a shot. He had a new degree, new career, but he didn't have experience. So he came in, and now he's literally about to hit his third path. He's about to get his next raise. He's already targeted in. We actually do quarterly raises for the apprentices also, immediate feedback. Rather than give them one big raise, we do quarterly raises. So they're getting that immediate feedback that they're used to. Uh, Rachel, well, oops, she got erased, but Rachel was a teacher before coming in through our industry transition program. And Nathan was a biology major. At the end of the day, if I used traditional you know, ATSs to block out all these resumes, and a biology major came through for a sales role, he's being escorted out the you know, back door to the black hole, to your point. I mean, really, he's being lost in a black hole somewhere. And so we were able to give them opportunities. We were able to set their expectations. Again, they're used to learning tests. That's how they're used to learning. And so we kept tests as part of it, but then we spun that off into practical. You know, the first time we give them a test, oh, what do I need to know to pass the test? That's how they've been ingrained. So rather than trying to teach them otherwise, take the bridge to say, okay, now we'll start with this. Now we're going to show you how this knowledge becomes practical. And they knew at any point how they stood in terms of their job. The other piece that was really exciting is how do I train? So I didn't have a training staff. I had myself and some interns. And so what we were able to do was take those mentors, it's Kyle, Angela, Adam, and Todd, really some of the heroes of this story, and we were able to have them each do an hour and a half of training a day. Because now Kyle was, being, was training the three other sales apprentices, not only his own. And so Angela was inclined to now want to train Kyle's apprentice. And so everyone collectively got him back to you know, uh, the Jack Hoffman story. 
everyone was on board. And that can take some challenges sometimes, but you've got to show them and, and again, find out what motivates each of them individually. We also gave them weekly progress reports where, again, you see kind of what 80% was their baseline. How did they compare against themselves as well as others? Show them that they're making progress. That was the big theme with all of them. I said, hey, guys, I'm not worried about perfection. I'm worried about progress. You know, this is good enough right now. Here's where you are. Next week is where good enough is. And keep pushing them on incremental, not expect magical performance stuff today. We're building a long-term career path for them. Uh, we also used cool tools like Flipboard. Uh, anyone use Flipboard? Does anyone have that app? So you can actually, on Flipboard, create a magazine for your company, for a department, whatever it may be, and you can flip articles from Forbes or wherever into there. You can write your own articles, put them up on a WordPress, flip them into there. And so they can, at their own time, on their mobile device, where they're used to operating, read into that. Uh, and then again, clear rewards. Uh, I'm going to get a little choked up because this uh, group is just, I mean, really an amazing, amazing group, guys. Uh, and again, words of amazing don't really mean anything. But you can see the excitement in their faces. We gave them certificates. Uh, you know, and, and again, it was just a really magical day. Uh, and they all had their certificates proudly displayed. Uh, I'm so proud. I mean, this, this is everyone in the company was part of this. I mean, we had engineers that were doing some of the technical training. I mean, everyone in the company was on board. And that's why this one gets me choked up a little bit. Uh, Anyway, uh, reach out to me. I'd be glad to share because I think as an Atlanta talent community, and, and when Ed asked me to kind of come out here and speak to you guys, I was excited because the reality is the better employees Atlanta as a whole has, whether it be sales, engineering, management, marketing, whatever it is, we collectively are all going to benefit. So if we develop great young or industry transition candidates into great employees and great team members, we all in this room will benefit. So I'll share every single thing we'll do. I'll spend as much time as it takes to say, hey, let me help you and show you where we hit these hurdles. I mean, 18 minutes is not always enough time to do it. Uh, so the last thought that I want to leave you with, and before I read the quote, uh, and I think, Alex, you kind of alluded to it a little bit, there's a, a, an ongoing fear about, oh, well, and, and management, this is one of their first objections to the program. They said, well, Brad, what if you know, we train all these people and they leave? Uh, we, we've all heard something like that before, right? Well, the reality is if we don't train Gen Y or any employee for that matter, they're going to leave because they're not getting the opportunity. And so I threw a lot of information and it seems very verbose and, and the, there's a lot going into it and it is. And is it perfect? No, it will never be perfect. And that's part of the fun of it. And so I really, really challenge all of you, whether it be something from my presentation or the presentation of any of my awesome, incredible peers, uh, to say this thing to yourself. That the best time to plant a tree was 20 years ago. The second best time? It's now. Take something you did from today and go and implement it today. Don't wait for tomorrow or the next 20 years to have a good tree. Thanks so much, and keep up the great work, Atlanta. Awesome place to work.